Can you think of a better song to start with? Mercy was there and grace was free. What a marvelous gift that comes from Calvary. We are so blessed today to celebrate the fact of Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. Because in that, he offers to us hope in the midst of whatever chaos happens in this world, whatever struggles we go through in our individual lives, God wants us to understand there is hope. Why? Because of the cross and the resurrection. He has come to give us life. Good morning. We welcome you as we join together at worship here at Columbus Avenue Baptist Church. And those of you who are viewing online, we are so glad to have all of you as we celebrate our Savior. I pray that God will use today to truly encourage you. Uh, I wrote about encouragement this morning. And we all need that encouragement. We need those to come alongside and encourage us whatever we face. And I pray that today what we do as we sing and as we open up God's word and as God's Holy Spirit speaks to us, that all of us would be encouraged as we learn, as we walk, as we grow in a relationship with Jesus Christ. I want you to join with me. Let's talk to our Heavenly Father. Father, we give thanks to you for today because of your grace. Thank you that it is free that you have offered it to us. We just have to come to you and put our faith in you, trust you, give you our lives. And Father, the beauty is, is when we give you our lives, you come into our life and you begin to show us the things that hurt us and harm us. And Father, you begin to show us how sin has so corrupted us and you come to forgive us so that you can transform us and change us and fill us with your presence. Fill us with your love. Show us how to live. And so, Father, today as we open your word, as we sing your praise, that, Father, your Holy Spirit will use it all to encourage us and draw us closer and closer to you. For, Father, this is our prayer. This is what we ask as we come before your holy throne through the wonderful gift of Jesus. For it's through him we pray. Amen. Let's join our hearts together. Let's sing his praise. Could you give us a D? I'm sorry. Could you give us a, a B? B? Yeah. Oh, draw me, Lord. Oh, draw me, Lord. Oh, draw me, Lord. And I'll run after
After that beautiful music, I want you to join with me and let's pray. <clears throat> Father, we come before your throne to say thank you. To say thank you for the hope and the power, the mercy and the life that comes to us because of Jesus Christ. Father, we realize that when we look at ourselves, we find ourselves as sinners. We find ourselves in rebellion against you so often, even as believers. And Father, how we need you. And so, Father, I ask that this morning your spirit would speak to us from your word. And Father, you would remind us of the incredible gift of life that is given to us in Jesus Christ. And all that that means Help us to have our eyes opened even wider to the incredible nature of you. Thank you again for giving us that hope through Jesus. Speak to us this morning. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Go ahead and open up your Bibles. 1 John chapter 4. If I were to ask you, those of you who are Christians this morning, which, as I look at the group here, the majority of us, as far as I can tell, if not all of us, know Jesus Christ as our Savior. What is the most important thing you need to understand about your Christian life? How would you answer that question? You see, we would think of all sorts of different things. What is the most important thing? We would think, well, I need to pray. I need to spend time in God's Word. I need to be at church. You know, that's, that's been one of the drawbacks. You know, it's tough getting us all together. Churches are struggling with all of that. So we think that maybe it's getting us together. That's the most important thing we need to understand about what it means to be a Christian. We see the world and we look at all the ways that they are going astray and we wonder, how can we make a difference in the world? Well, what's the most important thing I need to understand as a believer in Jesus Christ? And you see, it's this one thing that we're going to talk about in just a second that makes everything else in your life and in my life as a follower of Jesus Christ possible. It's actually what we've been talking about for the last two weeks. Really a little longer. But it's very simply found here in 1 John chapter 4, verse 4. Because you see, when you and I come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, when we put our faith in Him, He comes to dwell with us says, I'm not leaving you orphans, I'm coming to you. He says, I'm going to send the Spirit to you. And then the incredible thing, he says, the Father's going to come with us. We're going to be with you. We're going to dwell with you. You have a relationship with Jesus Christ. That means God himself is with you. And if God himself is with you, the greatest thing you need to understand about it all is this. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. 
You can look at the world and all that is happening and you can understand that dwelling inside your heart and in my heart is the greatest reality of all. And that is God. He created this universe. Everything he put into place. The writer of Psalms says he hung the stars and the moon and put them in place, and not one of them is missing. He knows when they are birthed, and he knows when they die. He knows all about those things that we're trying to still discover. He already knows. And the more we seem to seek in that, he wants us to understand that when we come to know him, he has come to dwell within us, and that makes all the difference. Because you see, one day we're going to stand before him in eternity. When all of life is over, we're going to stand before God. And when we stand before God, what he's going to look for is not your good works, not the deeds that you've done, not all the things. He's going to look to see one thing. Is my son in your life? And if he is in your life, have you trusted in him enough where greater is he that is in you than he who is in the world. He says, when you understand that relationship with Jesus, that's how you begin to determine what is true and what is false. Last week we looked at it. Six, verse six, it says very simply, this is how we recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. How, do you, how can you find what is true and what is not? Especially when today, how modern thinkers are talking about truth, they said, whatever is true for you is good. I have a deep problem with that. I'll give you the worst example I can think of. Is the truth of a pedophile as good as any truth you know? The truth is a pedophile is this. Doesn't matter how young, doesn't matter who they are, they are there for my pleasure, period. And I will take their innocence. That truth, now that's the extreme. But you can bring that back and back and back. And if we think we understand and we know truth, we end up finding truth becomes selfish When God comes to us and says truth is not selfish, it's giving. How do we know that? That's where we come to today. Verse 7, dear friends. Here's how he writes. He says, because we understand that God is greater in us, because we understand what God has done, dear friends, let us love one another for love comes from god everyone who loves has been born of god and knows god everyone i mean whoever does not love does not know god because god is love this is how god showed his love among us he sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him this is love Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sin. So when we look at this passage, he's telling us, let us love one another. We have to then understand if God is great, then his love must be greater than our love. And in that, God comes to demonstrate to us his love And he says, I want you to understand my heart. My heart is love. My heart has been love. That's the reason I created everything is because I wanted to create something that I could continue to love because I didn't need to to experience that because I had all the love within me I have. The Father loving the Son, the Son loving the Father, the Father loving the Spirit, the Spirit loving the Father, the Spirit loving the Son, the Son loving the Spirit. That love was what was flowing over. Karl Barth explained it this way. He said, 
when God so much loved, what had to happen is all of His love spilled over and He created. When He created, He created ultimately the apex of that creation is us. And so His desire is that He would love us. So the foundation of everything is the love of God. The love from God for us. It's God's love. That is the foundation of it all. There is nothing exists without the foundation of God's love. Now Moses, who tradition tells us, gave us the first five books in what better place. He was in a place where he had the Jewish learning because of the slaves that were in Egypt, and then the Egyptian learning, all of those that he learned from in the palace of Pharaoh. What better place for somebody to learn all that there was there so that he could write it down? And he writes it down, and we read the stories in Genesis and Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy. But in Numbers, after they had seen God bring the victory at the Red Sea, Moses and his sister Miriam sang these words in this incredible song found in Exodus 15, verse 13. He says this, though. In your unfailing love, You will lead the people you have redeemed. In your strength, you will guide them to your holy dwelling. God saw us in our sin. He began to work to bring us to it. Genesis shows us how bad we came, but yet God still was going to make a way as he started with Abraham. Then he saw how things began to dismantle and they ended up saving Egypt. And how did Egypt repay them? Well, they forgot about what they did And in that, because of Joseph's wisdom for Egypt and saving Egypt, they then put Joseph's descendants in slavery. There's a lesson for us to learn. You see, when we start looking to our ways, our ways become selfish about us. Pharaoh became afraid because God was blessing the Israelites The Israelites had already blessed Egypt because Egypt still existed. So did everybody else in the Middle East. And yet, what did they do? Uh, We're now afraid of them. So before we have to fight them, let's just turn them into slaves. That happens over and over again. The mighty begin to take it and say, we're just going to dominate you. That's where we get all of our understandings of dictators. They take over and they dominate. But God redeemed them. God brought them out of Egypt in power. He then demonstrated his power when he defeated the greatest army of the world at that time with the Red Sea. And as they then stood there, Moses and his sister sang about God's unfailing love. I hear it over and over again. The book of the Old Testament is a book about judgment. I think I've said that probably every sermon as we've gone through this, because it's the case, but yet when you really read the Old Testament, it begins to be a picture of God's grace and his love and his grace and his love in the midst of our sin and our rebellion, in the midst of our degradation against each other. He continues to love us and bring us and draw us to dream us, and he ultimately comes to redeem us, and then he comes to us and he says, this is What you need to understand, I have come to demonstrate my love for you, and therefore you need to understand how this foundation is critical to you. This foundation of his love for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have Greater is he who's in you. Well, that greater is going to give you eternal life. This body, when it dies, does not mean that we die. We're going to see that in a few minutes when we look at another passage. We begin to understand that God comes to give us life. And he does that because he demonstrates his love. Here's how John says he demonstrated his love. But he, in verse 10, he said, He loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for us paul said god demonstrated his love for us in this while we were yet sinners christ died for us but when he died for us he became 
the sacrifice for our sin. God in the flesh is the only one who could pay for the sin of mankind. Because only God could take care of the sin. God had to do something in order for our sin to be dealt with. And what he did is he became one of us. God in the flesh, Jesus. And when Jesus came in the flesh, he came so that he could go to the cross and take your place and my place. He died eternity's death when he died on the cross for us. And he took that. And he gave himself. He became our... That's why the entire sacrificial system of the Old Testament comes and it's bore out in Jesus Christ as he dies for us and gives us life and gives us hope. But you see, if he would have just died, if it would have just been the sacrifice, he could not be in us. He couldn't come to be greater as he who is in you than he who is in the world. It took the resurrection. Jesus had to conquer that sin. And he did when he rose from the dead so that he could offer us that life, our Christian life is based on the fact of God's love for us, which was demonstrated in Jesus, who then conquered our sins so that he could pour into our life himself so that he could be greater in you than that which is in the world. And as he does that, he, he wants to make it simple for us. Yet that simplicity becomes incredibly complex. If you got your Bibles, I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 15. I mean, excuse me, Matthew chapter 22. I had 15 in my head. Matthew 22. We're going to look at two stories, but I want you to see the heart of that story first. You see, the two stories is about Jesus being confronted first by the Sadducees, and then by the Pharisees. And in the midst of that conversation, he gives us what is the greatest commandment and the second greatest commandment. In the middle of all of this, they've asked him a question, and Jesus has replied to their question. This is verse 37. These are Jesus' words. He says, Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all your soul, with all of your mind. This is the first and greatest of all commandments. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus says that is what is of critical importance. And he's telling that to those who have been trying to find a way to catch Jesus. And if either one of them can find a way to catch Jesus, they can stop everything Jesus is doing. And it starts... Here in Matthew 22 were the Sadducees. Now you remember the Sadducees did not believe in a resurrection. They did not believe there was an afterlife. They believed this life was all there was. And if you live to God, he's going to bless you. He's going to take care of you. And we're going to get all we can get in this life because God's going to bless us because there is nothing to come. So they come to trick Jesus. And when they come to trick Jesus... We find this take place. It says this, that same day, some Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came up to him and questioned him. Teacher, they said. This is in verse 24. Moses said, if man dies, having no children, his brother is to marry his wife and raise offspring off for his children, for his brother. Now, there were seven brothers among us. The first got married and died, having no offspring. He left his wife to his brother. The same thing happened to the second, the third, and so on, till all seven, last of all, the woman died. Here's their question. In the resurrection, then whose wife will she be of the seven? For they had all married her. Well, if you're going to be like those Pharisees over there, 
And you're going to believe that what we do here, we get to do for eternity? Well, there's seven brothers who never had a child. They all had one wife, one at a time. Whose wife shall we be in the resurrection? Of course, they're trying to trap Jesus, saying, well, there is no resurrection, or there's, he's going to say something about marriage, or he's going to do something. So Jesus answered them, hear what he says. You're mistaken because you don't know the scriptures of the power of God. Dear Sadducees, you don't know what the word says and you don't know what God can do. For in the resurrection, they're neither marry nor be given in marriage. All are like angels in heaven. In other words, we're not going to have a marriage relationship except one. It will be the body of Christ, the church, married to the son. The groom and the bride. We're the bride, he's the groom. We're going to spend eternity in that relationship. He then says, now concerning the resurrection of the dead, haven't you read what was spoken to you by God? He's going to quote them scripture. I am, God says, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. He said, they're still alive. When the crowds heard this, they were astonished at his teaching. So they're trying to say, we're going to trap him, so we're going to use marriage, and we're going to use it in a way that he's going to have to answer in Scripture, and he's going to have to answer in a way that we can do that. But when they tried to trap him, he showed them the power of God and the truth of the Scripture. Pharisees were happy. But the Pharisees still wanted to get Jesus. But they were happy because Jesus agreed that there is a resurrection, there is life. And when the Pharisees heard that they had scienced the Sadducees, they came together and one of them, an expert of the law, asked a question to test him. Teacher, which command is the greatest? To test him. Okay, tell us what's the greatest commandment. That's when Jesus says, Here's the greatest commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now, to the Sadducees and the Pharisees both, hear what Jesus says. He says, all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. These two commandments hold it all. If you can follow these two, you can walk in obedience to the ten, and not just to the ten, but all of the ceremonial law that God has for you. You can be obedient to him. You can almost hear the Pharisees going, okay, I think we've got him. We can use this in our trap. We're ready to spring it. He has stepped onto the plate. He's, we're waiting for him to put his weight on it so that the bear trap can come around his leg. And we've got him. For this is what they said. Well then, if you answer this way, what do you think about the Messiah? Whose son is he? The son of David, they replied. So he said to them this. He now turns their trap, all of a sudden they realize they're in the trap. Jesus is out of the trap when he says this. How is it then that David, speaking by the Spirit, calls him, that is the Messiah, Lord? For he says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. He's saying the Messiah is the one that David's speaking to, And we know the Messiah is coming from David, so how does David speak to the Lord who is his Lord who is also going to be his son? Now there's your riddle. And the Pharisees who got all excited thought we've got Jesus in the trap 
all of a sudden realized that they were standing in the middle of the trap and Jesus had them. Because look at what it says. No one could say a word in reply. And from that day on, no one dared ask him any questions. He took the Sadducees and the Pharisees, both sides, left and right. And when he did that, he brought them the truth of God's word because they really didn't understand the scripture or God's power. And he said, here are the commandments. This is what God desires to do. The entire Old Testament is based on this fact. You are to now love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. You're to love him with everything you've got, and you then are to take that love that you have for him, and you're to express that to your neighbors. You're to show God's love everywhere, but you first have to have what? Received his love. And implied in this incredible passage is when Jesus says, you don't know God or the power of God, it says, you don't know the love of God. You don't know what Moses sang about. You don't know what Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel wrote about. You don't understand what took place in the Exodus or in when they came back from the Babylonian captivity. You don't understand God's love. But when you understand God's love, he's going to show you the importance of that love, and that is to return that love back to him because love is expressed ready to be received. That's what marriage is about. Love is expressed and received. When a man and a woman come together and they unite their lives, it is an expression of giving and receiving through all of their marriage. It, yes, it's given in the picture of the sexual relationship, but it's even more than that because it's to be the emotional relationship which they're bonded together and the spiritual relationship in which God takes the two and makes them what? One. That's what marriage is to be all about. And it's so that we can understand the incredible love that God has for us. That's why Jesus in his prayer says, Father, you and I are one, but he says, make them one as we are one. Help us to be the body of Christ that we should be so that we can understand his love, so that we can demonstrate the great commandments, but then we can also understand the importance of the new commandment. You know there's a new commandment, right? As the body of Christ, he gave us a new one. In John 13, Judas had left. Now the Son of Man, Jesus said, is glorified and God is glorified in him. This is verse 31, John 13. Now if God is glorified in him, God will glorify the Son in himself and will glorify him at once. My children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now where I'm going. Right now you cannot come. But my children, I will be with you only a little while. You will look for me and just as the Jews... So I tell you now where I'm going, you cannot come, but a new commandment I give you. Love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Jesus is telling them, here's what the church is to be. If we are to be in a relationship with God and we understand God's love and we're to reciprocate that love, well, in that we are to love our neighbor, but that is to be an special part inside that which is the body of Christ. Those who are Christ's own disciples, he says, you are to demonstrate your love for each other. This is absolutely imperative because by this, Everyone will know you are my disciples if you love one another. Why has the church lost its moral ground of speaking truth to our country? It's because the body of Christ does not love one another. Why have we lost in the eyes of the world what God had 
purchased as he brought it into our life and as he had poured his spirit into every time we've went through a great awakening god has poured his spirit into the church and when he pours his spirit into the church they learn to love one another and they learn to express it to a world we've had disasters going on around the world and where did taking care of those in disaster started have you ever heard of the red cross salvation army we hear the term disaster relief where did disaster relief came from it came from the churches responding to disasters you see when we go through trials when the church becomes the church it loves it it loves within itself but then it expresses that love so that the world will see and Jesus says, they will never know that you are my disciples until you love one another. And if you don't love one another, they're not going to believe you. This is the critical mass for us. Why? Because greater is he who is in you, who loved you, who cares for you, who fills you. If he is greater in you, he is greater so that you now are able to love as he loved us. That's what his greatness does in our lives. It is so that we might experience his love and so that those who hate him today will experience his love. Why? Because we were sinners when he saved us. He loved us that much course peter is no different than we are <laughs> here's how peter responded to when jesus said you're to love one another well lord where are you going <laughs> he doesn't hear the message he just goes where are you going where i'm going you cannot follow but you will follow later <laughs> peter said, why can't i follow you now now here's peter peter's like us you know, we, we go to a revival service. We have one of those times where God really gets into our life. And man, we're ready. We can do anything God asks us to do. And we're like Peter. I will lay down my life for you. I will do whatever you ask. And of course, Jesus gives him those incredible words next. Before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. And in Peter's mind at that point, that's the absolute last thing he's expecting to do but he does you remember when jesus restored peter what he said peter do you love me we've all failed we all fall short but jesus who loves us always comes along our side and he says do you love me do you really really love me because you see i loved you when you were a sinner i loved you when you were in rebellion against me i loved you when you really didn't want anything to do with me and i didn't stop and then you responded and finally came and you received my love and now you're learning what it is to love me and when you love me, I want that love to so fill you that it will be demonstrated to others. And that's why as the church, our main priority is to love one another. And then we're to love one another as Jesus does. You remember Jesus says, when you're my disciple, you're going to do what I do. Well, who did he love? He loved us when we were sinners and yet his enemy. And he demonstrated his love for us when we were his enemy. He died for us. And when he fills our life with his love and we walk as he does, we love one another, but yet we also love those who don't know him, who are at this point, what? His enemies just as we were thus jesus in his main sermon as he began that powerful sermon and he began to talk about us being salt and light he said this you have heard it said love your neighbor 
hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. For he causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good. He sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. He tells us to love our enemies. He tells us to love those who don't know him. That's the difference he makes. He says, I bring rain on the just and the unjust. I got a question for y'all. How many of you just had a wonderful time enjoying breathing all the smoke? Anybody enjoyed breathing all the smoke? I probably could get 100% compliance. If I talked to everybody in the state of Washington, Oregon, probably California, and those guys on boats between here and Hawaii where the smoke was, and said, how many of you enjoyed the smoke? Even smokers wouldn't enjoy the smoke. God says, though, I send rain where? On the just and the unjust. When he cleared the smoke, did he clear the smoke only for believers? <laughs> or did he clear it for everybody? He cleared it for everybody. When Jesus died on the cross, he died and he paid the penalty for everybody. The difference will be is will you accept God's love or reject God's love? Will you accept the truth or will you accept falsehood? And as believers for us, he says, will you then accept me? And because I am greater in you than he who is in the world, will you demonstrate me in my power to the world as you love one another and as you love the world in the same manner that Jesus did. When we talk about what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ, the most important element of being a father, follower of Jesus Christ is what John said. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. What will you do today with Jesus? Will you accept him? Will you follow him? Will you allow him to live in you and through you? What will you do today with Jesus? I want us in here to bow our heads. For those of you who are watching online, I'm offering an invitation to us all. If today you have never put your faith in Jesus Christ, I want you to understand today God loves you. You see, I'm going through all these trials. He still loves you. You see, because he went through those trials too when he came to this earth. Jesus suffered in ways that all of us suffer, but yet he also suffered in ways we don't because he was and is the Messiah. And he wants you to understand he knows where you're at, he knows what you're going through, and he loves you. And he wants to pour his power, his strength, his life into you. But you come to him by faith. If you will put your faith in Jesus Christ, he will give you a brand new life if you will trust him. You can express that trust first by a prayer. You can ask him to forgive you of your sin. You can thank him for dying on the cross for you. And you can receive him into your life as you ask him to come in, because if you ask, he will come. Will you put your faith in him today? If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, if you are a believer of Jesus, 
and you have spent more time angry, mad, criticizing, confused. Today is the day you trust that which is in you. May you recommit your life to him and allow him to fill you with his love so that he can express that love. So that this world today that is so filled with hatred, bitterness, and anger can see the difference that he makes. Will we today trust the greatness that is in us and put our trust in Jesus as he pours out his love through you and me? Father, we come before your throne today and we give thanks to you for the marvelous grace of Jesus. Because, Father, it is because of your grace, which is the epitome of your love for us, that Jesus died on the cross. Father, it amazes me that if I was the only one, he would have died for me. If any of us, if we were the only ones, he would have died for us. You love us so much. I pray that we will put our faith in you. And that we as believers will experience and give your love so that this world will see you and the difference you truly make in our lives as we trust you. Thank you, Father, for giving us Jesus. For this we ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. If you're here this morning and you've made a decision along that line, see me after the service. If you're online and you've made that decision, let us know. Give us a phone call. You can call the church. And if you get an answering machine, leave a message. We'll get back to you. It's 509-773-4471. Or maybe just go on our Facebook page. Go on our website. Go to Goldendale, Columbus Avenue Baptist Church. Go to these places. And let us know so that we might help you, we might pray for you, we might encourage you. We will give you some things to help you grow in your walk with Christ. Our desire is that all of us would walk with him every day of our life. And you see, I, as we experience that love, is the more you experience God's love, the wonderful thing about God's love is it makes you hungry for him even more. Because, you know, one day we're going to get to experience all of him. We're not getting all of him, even though all of him is in us. We can't handle all of him right now. But one of these days when we're in his presence, we will see him as he is because we will be like him. And oh, what a day that will be. But until then, experience him. Gain that hunger. And as we sing, as the deer, as the deer hungers and thirsts for May we hunger and thirst for God. May God truly bless you as you walk in the greatness of our Heavenly Father and you show everyone His love. May God bless you. Let's join our hearts and let us sing. Oh,
again.